Welcome. My name is David, and as you know, I work with TLC, and I'm kind of the TLC technical coordinator. And this is part two of my talk about the things that people should know about the internet and computers. The first part was about windows and files and folders and manipulating windows and things like that. This one is for pretty much everybody. There's going to be some elements that are the same, but mostly it's new information about the internet. And we're going to get going right now. This thing is called the Internet and the World Wide Web, essential information for life today. And if you think I'm kidding, think again. It's essential. The Internet is a word for a set of mechanisms, that is to say, software rules and hardware rules, that allow computers and other devices to all over the world to communicate with each other directly. By that I mean that information is sent from one device to another device without it passes through other devices along the way but it's pointed at a particular computer it starts from one computer or device and goes to another computer or device and to do this you have to have a unique address for each device and then along here i'd like to point out a metaphor the metaphor is think of the uh, u.s mail system the postal service as it is in the u.s and other countries and you have to address an envelope to Whoever you want to send it to, you have a return address that says where it came from. And those mails can be in transit, and they have to go through lots of stops along the way. And um, they eventually end up where they're supposed to go, or they get returned. Or various other things can happen, like they can just get lost somewhere in the clouds of USPS operations. But the main metaphor here is that things are broken up into chunks, and that there are... Uh, um, messages that are sent in a particular sequence, they may not arrive in the same sequence. So imagine you've got friends in different cities and you're sending different letters to different friends in different cities and they're going to respond to you in their own good time. And you can have several requests to people in other cities for things like send me photos of your new baby or pictures of your dog. And they can respond when and if they want to. And then the, um, the number of different communications you can have is pretty much unlimited. And they can be talking to other people, and other people can be talking to them. And then those responses come back to you because there's a return address on everything. If you speed that up about a billion times, that's what's happening on the World Wide Web and the Internet. The Internet, if you think about, hear the word Internet, don't think World Wide Web, think communications mechanisms. And the most common way allows both ends of a connection to send and receive messages at the same time. Again, like the Postal Service. Your friend, if he knows your address, can send you mail. You can send him mail about one topic or another topic. And what those messages mean doesn't mean anything to the post office. It doesn't mean anything to the Internet. It's inside a container, and in that container is some information that you interpret the way you want to interpret it. So in this case, the data communications, as we call it, the mechanisms, how messages move from place to place, don't care about the content. The content is completely irrelevant. Uh, there's some exceptions, but I'm not going to go into them here. Um, the programs or software on either end allow um, the programs that talk to them to understand what that means. And the big example here, of course, is the web. Um, once again, when phones were introduced in the world, uh, everybody had a, just a name. You know, get me George Bly. He lives over on South Street. But then very soon after that, it became too complicated and people had to um, come up with phone numbers. And then phone numbers grew, and now we all have 10-digit dialing, or in some parts of the world, 11-digit dialing. Um, but the fact is, it's very difficult to use, because with 10 digits or 11 digits, remembering everybody's number is a giant pain. Just like, And so we came up with phone books, and phone books allow you to look up somebody and get somebody's phone number. And even in another city, you can have a phone book for London or a phone book for New York, and you can look up people's numbers. The Internet has the same kind of system. And what happens there is what we call pretty names, like CNN.com, can be converted to an actual numerical address, like the phone number. And um, this operation is very much like a phone book. I'm going to talk a little more about it. Now, one of the big things you can do to solve your problems is using Internet searches. I wrote a document about that. It's available to be read. If you have the PDF for the slides, you can just click on the link there and read it. And I advise that you do. How do you connect to the internet? Well, there's a lot of different ways, but all of them result in the same thing. You all end up on the same superhighway of information from one place to another. 
One of them is cable modems, which I use. We have an Xfinity account, and in a room back in the garage is a thing called a cable modem that takes the cable data from Xfinity and converts it into um, house-based uh, internet called Ethernet, and it goes through a router. Now, DSL is something that happens over phone lines. It stands for Digital Subscriber Line, and it's what a lot of people use who have CenturyLink and other providers, and it's the same idea. How it gets to your house doesn't really matter. What matters is once it's in your house, it's turned into wireless or wired signals that are common across all types of equipment. If you're using a cell phone, you're using what's called cellular data service. And that's the thing you pay for based on the gigabyte of how much service you use. And um, if you uh, look at it from a mechanical point of view, your phone is talking to a cell tower and all the messages back and forth, including your phone calls, go to that cell tower. And if it's designed or directed to the internet, then it is dropped into the internet superhighway and it gets to its destination. But the idea is the same. Everybody has a global address and every connected device can, in theory, connect to every other device in the world. Again, there are some exceptions, but I'm not going to bore you with all those. For home users, really, your house is the thing that gets a single internet address. And inside the house, all the things connected on Wi-Fi or connected directly by cable to the modems get internal addresses in the house that the router knows about. The router is literally a router. Messages come back to the house, and in the message is the directed destination in the house, and the router's job is to turn it into the address that's known in the house. Businesses do this all day long. Uh, one of the analogies I use here is if you have a business, and in a business you might have multiple extensions, and so you call up, uh, I don't know, Verizon, and you say, can I have extension 3419, please? Um, and you're calling one phone number, but there's a bunch of other sub-phone numbers inside. They're all done through their, what's called PBX, their, their, their personal branch exchange, the way that they're routed inside. Most of the computers that we use and phones, all the connections are either wireless, which we call Wi-Fi, or wired, which is called Ethernet wiring. And I'm using Ethernet wiring on my computer, but my tablets and my phone use Wi-Fi. Now, phone connections can be either cellular data or Wi-Fi, and a lot of people are confused by this. When you're on Wi-Fi, it's sending your internet information over the Wi-Fi signal to your router and out onto the internet. When you're using only cellular data, like you're out in your car, it's going to the cell tower. But the results are exactly the same, and all of this is very carefully designed to be very much invisible to you. Um, addresses and names. An internet address, is a four-part number that looks like this, 32.16.105.10, and I think of that as a phone number. And um, there's only one set of numbers, and every device has a unique number, every one that's online. Now, sometimes they're shared, so somebody might get that same number, and then when he stops talking, somebody else will get that number. But the idea is it's a unique number. But if somebody's really popular, like Amazon.com, nobody wants to type in, a nine digits or 12 digits to get to Amazon, they want to type Amazon.com. That system, which is like a phone book, is called the Domain Name Services, or DNS. So if you go to a web browser and you type in the word Amazon.com or you click on a bookmark to Amazon, at that point, your computer system, your browser, whatever, talks to the domain name services that are available to your system and converts that to a number so it can get the actual internet address. Now, don't get scared because all of this is absolutely automatic. You do not need to know the details of how this works. What is the World Wide Web? Well, let's go back to the idea of an extension on a, uh, public, on a PBX in an office. If you call some office, a Chase Bank or whatever, and you happen to know the, the extension of the person you want to talk to, you can just give the extension and be connected. Likewise, when you're talking to a computer, there may be multiple programs or services running on that computer, all of which are actually on the internet, connected to the internet at the same time. And they do different things. One of them might be the web. One might be a database. Another one might be a video streaming service or a music streaming service. And what you need to know is an additional number that is called the port number. And the World Wide Web is just a communication service that computers uh, use port 80 for. 
and we call computers that use port 80 web servers. And really all that happens is that a computer like yours, type, you type in a request for Amazon.com and it sends a message to Amazon saying, get me that page. And the Amazon.com server ass assigns you to a, a web server temporarily and it gathers up the right information, tailors that page for who you are and what they're selling today and any other thing they want to say and delivers that textual information to your device, to your tablet, to your iPhone, to your computer. And so all it is is requests coming from your computer going to some remote ser web server. The web server gathers the information and returns it. Now, it might be an error. For example, if you request a page that doesn't exist, we've all seen error code 404. Or it could be something that's completely generated at the time you enter it, like a search. When you do a search, the page it returns you has never been delivered to anybody before. It's completely crafted for it to respond to you. Every web document, every web page or every web search is given what's called a uniform resource locator or URL. And that's an address not just of the server you're talking to or even the particular port on that server, but of the specific document on that server. And all that happens is when those documents begin to flow back to your system, your web browser, and we'll talk about that in a minute, is responsible for formatting that document on your screen according to the data that's in the document and the various styles that were attached to that document. There's more to it than that, but the idea is the information is downloaded to your computer and your browser makes it look like a web page. That's the job of the browser. Here's an example of a URL, and I've done it in some color here. The uh, first part of it is the protocol specifier, HTTPS, which means technically hypertext transfer protocol secure. Now, I won't go into the details of why it's called that, but that really means the web, but the web with security, with encryption on both ends. It's a request to do something. The colon slash forward slash forward slash is a separator. The name of the website that I'm going to is tlc-services.org. That's the TLC website. Then the slash says, look in the top level folder, and then the useful information.html says to the web server, give me this document. Now, that document might be a real document, as in the case with our web server, or it might be something made up that triggers a piece of software on the other end to generate a response. But let's talk about just as a document right now. That web page has uh, links to images, it has links to fonts, has links to scripts and styling information, but it's all driven by getting that initial document there. And this thing, this URL, is a complete specifier of what that browser, what that web viewer wants to show you at that moment. Now, we don't have any demonstrations here. The demonstrations are coming at the end of this section, so bear with me. What is a browser? Now, long ago, when I first started working with TLC, I asked the question of, in the, of the crowd, who knows what a browser is? Very few people knew what a browser was. A browser is just a program that runs on a phone or a computer or a tablet that visits websites and it knows how to request data from a web server and format that format that data according to the styles and rules that are laid down by the international commissions that run the web. Common browsers include Edge, Chrome, Firefox, and Safari if you're on Apple machines. And we'll talk about those and I'll demonstrate those. All the browsers are mostly compatible. In other words, their job is to go to a website like Google or Amazon or, or Facebook and go get the data and display it on the screen in almost exactly the same way, the same colors, the same divisions, the same outline. And they generally, and you can put them side by side and you'll see that they're very, very similar, not identical. And they change sometimes depending on how big the window is. You can have a small window like on an iPhone or a big window like on my screen. But the idea is that the data is pretty much all the same. Now, one of the niftiest features of modern browsers is they have a thing called tabs. And I'll demonstrate that in a minute. And tabs are really uh, ways of having connections to multiple websites at the same time in the same browser and just choose which one you want to look at. Because remember, you're really only talking to one program and typically one window at a time, even on a phone. Uh, you're talking to one thing at a time. And the tabs allow you to maintain multiple open things. For example, you might have a Facebook tab. 
you might have a, a, a Google search tab, you might have a, a, a news tab, you might have a dozen others. Sometimes my wife has 30 or 40 tabs that could be activated at any given time. And browsers are very flexible. You can change the font size for your vision problems, you can change the window size, you can change the way information is, is constructed, and you can also talk to the website and say you want to reorganize the way they're showing you data. So we're going to talk about some of that flexibility in a minute. Also, you can go into what's called the address bar or the search box and you can type a search. You can type in some words like um, uh, low cost air travel New York and see what comes up. And sometimes they get a lot of good data and sometimes you get a bunch of junk. But how you distinguish those two things, I'll talk about a little bit later on. Here is Firefox as a display. And in this Firefox, if you notice up here at the top, I have two tabs. The one I'm looking at is headlined as, as titled Google News. Now there's another one over here that I could point at called Stocks Bloomberg. That's, that's stocks on the US stock market. And I can have more. Using the little X on the right, I can close a tab. And using the plus sign at the end, I can create a new tab that's completely blank and lets me go wherever I want. And this is the beauty of the tab system. And you'll see tabs in use in a lot of places, in a lot of applications on phones and tablets and Windows. And uh, uh, whether it's Mac OS or Windows, by window I mean in general. The idea of a tab, as I said in the earlier talk, is the idea that in a filing cabinet you might have a lot of file folders and you want to be able to scan the file folder and pull out the one with the data you want. So you have these little plastic tabby things with words on them that lets you run your finger down there and pull out the one you want. That's exactly the analogy that's being driven here. Um, you can close any tab at any time and some browsers are, can, can be configured to keep the uh, uh, the tabs that you normally keep open open so that every time your browser opens it opens all the same tabs or you can have them close all the tabs and you can start over every time you open a browser. Now a bookmark is a simple idea. It's just a saved web page address. It's just a URL. So I can have a bookmark for, um, for Amazon and other things. If I go back to the previous slide, you can see right here I have a, I have a bookmark for Facebook and one for Google News and one for my YouTube channel and other things. And what happens is all a bookmark is is that you give it a name like uh, shopping. But underneath that it says Amazon.com. And so when you click on shopping, the browser says, oh, she wants shopping, but I know that what that means is go to Amazon.com and load that web page. And that's what it does. Now, you can have bookmarks all over the place, and I'll show you a few when I do the demonstrations, but you can have them in toolbars, you can have them in separate windows, you can have them in your menus, um, or you can even put them directly on your desktop to go right to some place you like to go a lot of the time. And the way you learn about this is by going into your browser's settings and finding out what you can do with bookmarks. You can also go to YouTube and look up videos on handling bookmarks in whatever browser you use, whether it's Edge or Chrome or whatever. Downloading. Now, a lot of people get confused about downloads and uploads, and I'm going to talk about them today. A download means go get me a document or a file. Maybe it's an MP3 file, maybe it's a video, maybe it's a Word document, off some website. And that is a special mechanism inside the whole web scheme that says copy a file from the remote web server onto the user's computer so the user can save it and use it. And uh, this is a wonderful feature. However, most systems and most browsers default to putting all your downloaded data into one folder called Downloads. And I have seen upwards of 3,000 files in some people's downloads folder. This is a mess. It means nobody can ever find anything. And if you went back six months later, you would never be able to find what you were looking for. So I always use a common browser feature that says, don't stick it in downloads. Always ask me where to save it. And I typically don't open them right away off the web, but you can. And what it does then is it downloads it to a temporary location on your system drive. Your, your, your disk, if you want to call it that, and open that temporary version. 
What I do is I set my browser to ask me where to put it and I put it someplace and I will demonstrate that as I move on here because this saves confusion. As you know, if you've listened to my other talk, you know that there's a big deal about organizing your disk space for finding things, for organizing them by project or by concept or by work effort or by family or in many, many other ways, your church, your, your musical group, your sports affiliations. Put them in separate folders and you will be able to find them because they will make sense to you. But I can't tell you what that is because I'm not you. Everyone's different. This is a search page. Now, what is a search engine? Well, that's a fancy term for a website that takes some words that you typed in and returns you possible choices of places you might want to visit. If you notice up here, I have typed in the words mortgage refinance rates and I get a bunch of stuff. And notice most of them are, they mention the word ad. That means somebody's paying Google to put that first or at least high up in the rankings. Um, you, meet, you can look at those and sometimes they're very good places to go and sometimes they're not. Um, but again, a search engine just takes the words you used, tries to figure out what you're really looking for, compares it to other things other people have liked or looked at when they typed in similar words and makes recommendations to you about where to visit. I always recommend that you learn a little bit about URLs to check the websites you're visiting because there are some websites out there that can do your system harm if your system isn't properly updated. And so I recommend you learn a little about that and we'll talk about that a little more. Okay, I wanna be very clear about this notion about accounts in websites or uh, apps. An account just means a way to identify you and make sure that other people can't easily pretend to be you. The account usually has a username. Now, the username can be anything at all. It could be, you know, George III. But most websites want you to use an email address because, first of all, it identifies you uniquely because, generally speaking, you're the only people who uses that address. But also, it means that if something bad happens, like you lose your password, you can ask them to give you a new password and they will send you a link that lets you create a new password. This is a wonderful new feature of the web and it has to do with the fact that your username, if it's an email address, they always know how to reach you and they can warn you about problems with your account. They can send you uh, things to update. Or in my case, if some, uh, some uh, electronic site has something I want to buy on sale, it'll tell me, oh, there's a sale today on your widget. It's only $29.95 or whatever. Now, I want to point out here that this password that other sites use has nothing to do with the password for your email account at your email provider. Many of you use uh, Gmail. Many of you use things like CenturyLink or Xfinity for your, uh, for your email. And in all those cases, you have to have a special password that tells that email provider that you are who you say you are. But on other places like Facebook or Amazon or any place else you want to go, Strava, for example, is a bike app that I use. When Strava wants to know a password, it's the password for Strava. It's not the password for my email account. I may be using an email name, an email address, but the password I'm using is unique to Strava. My email account password is nobody's business but mine and the email account providers. Again, we're going to learn some jargon here. A combination of a username and password is known as credentials, which means the same thing in the web that it means everywhere else. It means a way to prove who you are. One of the nice features in the modern websites and apps is that big companies like Google and Facebook and Microsoft allow you to use your Google account or Facebook account email as the account on another website. And when a website does that, they don't get to know your password. They don't get to know anything but that Google says you're who you say you are or Facebook says you're who you say you are. And for example, when I use Zoom, I don't um, have a Zoom account as a Zoom account with a Zoom password. I log in under one of my Gmail emails, and then when it comes in, it says log in with Google. I click on Google. I pick the account. I fill in the password, or usually the browser fills it in for me. And then Google politely tells Zoom, yes, this really is David Hovel. This really is his account. And so Zoom doesn't know anything more than the fact that I am the guy behind that Gmail account. And one of the problems with some of these newer systems is you may have multiple accounts. For example, when I go to Amazon, 
Bonnie has an account and I have an account. So when I go to buy something and I say, okay, check out, it's going to ask me, well, who the hell are you? You know, are you David? <clears throat> Excuse me. Are you Bonnie or are you somebody else entirely? And if you have multiple accounts for a single site like Zoom or Gmail, um, you need to find out which account you're currently using. And if you look at your Gmail, uh, you'll notice that up in the upper right hand corner, there's a little icon that says who you are at the moment. It may be your TLC Gmail, it may be a personal Gmail, it may be your family Gmail, or it may be the one you use to surf the net for porn. I don't know. But it's important to know which one you are. And this is pretty much the same thing with all smartphones and tablet apps. And remember, always, always, always write this down. Your username and password, the name of the site, maybe when you did it, and always keep that information private to yourself. Don't assume that you're going to remember it or that anybody else will remember it or that it will be available to you because it could get lost easily and people get super confused. And whenever someone says to me, well, I don't have my password, my first thought is, you don't know what's going on because if you don't have your password, that's like my selling you a car and you're losing the keys. And that's a bad thing. There is a magic piece of software, kind of software, called password managers. And these are really, really cool things. I'll talk about them a little later on. And there's a bunch of them. And their main job is remembering all that stuff for you and filling in your forms for you. Now, sometimes you have password managers that are built into browsers. Like Firefox has a really good one. Chrome has one. They all do. But other kinds of personal information should be kept private and should be kept encrypted and should be kept somewhere other than a piece of paper stuck underneath your keyboard, which is a trick a lot of people use, or in the lap drawer where you use your computer, or maybe sometimes just to post it on the top of your computer. Don't do that. Write them down somewhere privately or use a password manager. Now, I want to talk about something that has come up a lot in, in the near term uh, last year or so. And that is cookies. What is a cookie? Well, the problem is that when a website is visited by someone, that website has no idea who that person is. In general, it doesn't know anything about that person. And so as the person logs in, they will request your browser to save a cookie of some data. And that data is usually an encrypted version of your account information that is saved to your local computer. And sometimes it's the identity of your shopping cart. And sometimes it's just the place that you left off or your preferences, like what color you like your background to be. These things are stored on your machine or your phone. And they're kept in the directories that or the folders that the browsers use. And um, they allow a lot of good stuff. For example, you go back to a website, it knows how you logged in, it knows um, what you have in your shopping cart, it knows your colors and your preferences, and it can behave the way you like it to behave without you having to tell it all over again. I clear all my cookies all the time. There's a reason for that. I won't go into it. I recommend that, but I think most people would find that difficult. But why are we getting all these messages on websites about cookies now? Well, that didn't used to happen. The reason is because the European Union decided somehow that cookies were bad and that websites should always warn people when they're using cookies. Um, I find it ridiculous because cookies have been around since the web was created. They are very well understood. They're easy to get rid of. You can limit who saves cookies. But the European Union in its infinite wisdom and its bureaucratic hierarchy decided that everybody needed to be warned if cookies were being used. So I have to click through all these, we're saving cookies, and if you don't like it, then you can die uh, messages. Now, California has recently jumped on this bandwagon. So here in the U.S., we suffer from the fact that we could visit a European website. I bought books off French Amazon or music off the English Amazon. And California is jumping onto the bandwagon because of the problems with people being having their data sold and people getting into trouble and not knowing how to deal with it. So I'm going to show you a few things now, and we're going to get into some demonstrations. I'm minimizing my presentation here. And I'm going to bring up Chrome. I'm going to try to do this slowly. If you notice, my cursor kind of has little trails all along behind it, so you can see where it is, and my cursor is black. I'm going to come to this upper corner here, and notice there's a picture of me. When I click on that, it tells me that I'm using the account admin at tlcservices.org. 
Now, I can switch to another account. I actually have two primary Gmail accounts, one for TLC and one for everything else. But I can always tell which one it is because of this picture and because I can click on it and it tells me which one I am right now. Now, the nine dots, as you know, are how you get to these Google apps. But for right now, I'm going to do Gmail. I'm going to click on the Gmail here and I'm bringing up Gmail. I'm going to make this window a little smaller here and I'm going to move it over to the side and I'm going to bring up Firefox. And I'm going to go to the stocks page and look to see how badly my stocks are doing today. Well, they're up a little bit. That's good. So I'm going to, I'm going to stretch this window down. And once again, notice that if I want to see all of Chrome, I can click over here on Chrome and it comes to the top. Or I can click over here on Firefox and it will come to the top. And um, I want to show you tabs. Now, notice over here I've got a plus sign up in the title bar. If I click on that, I get a brand spanking new empty tab. Now I'm going to click over here on a bookmark that I've saved for TLC services. Notice when I hover over that, it comes up and says TLC services, which is the name I gave it, and HTTPS whack whack colon slash 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 um, TLC services dot org. So all a bookmark is is a pretty name that means something to you and a web name that means something to the browser. Now I'm on the TLC services website and um, I can scroll around and look at stuff. Now over here in Firefox, I can, for example, oops, made it too big. Didn't want to do that. I can click over here. I can right click on this Google news and I can say open a new tab. And what it is, there's the latest, um, there's the latest news from, um, from Google. And I can close a tab by just clicking on the X. I can open another tab. Like if I want to read this article about a retired top general, I can right click on it and open it in a new tab. And I do that all the time. And now I've got this article. Notice I'm only ever looking at one web page at a time. I'm not caring to see a whole bunch of stuff smirched together. But each of these browsers, and I can give you an example here. Let me go ahead and go to Google. news. Now here we have a comparison, a head-to-head -head comparison. Notice it's pretty much the same thing because the job of the browser is to visit a website and present what the website wants to present according to the rules of the website, which means they really ought to come out pretty much the same. It's kind of like, you know, playing checkers in France and playing checkers in England. The checkers is checkers, chess is chess. And that's kind of how the web works in the same way. Um, now, I'm going to show you that you can switch between tabs either by just clicking on the tab at the top or you can hold down the control key, not the alt key, but the control key at the lower left hand corner of your keyboard and hitting tab. So notice I'm hitting tab and it's switching to different tabs whenever I do that. Um, I'm going to go to the TLC website and I'm going to go to the events and information page, right? And um, I, here's a document. Now notice when I hover over this, at the bottom of the, of, the, of the browser, in little letters, it tells me exactly which document I'm going to get. I'm going to get using Zoom TLC events. I'm going to click on that. And there, it's showing me a PDF. Now, up here in the corner, when I move, when I move this again, it shows me this download and the universal symbol for a download is an arrow pointing downward. And remember download means put it on the computer, on my computer. So I can take this document, it's got the document name and it says, where do you want to put it? And I'm going to say, I want to put it in my temp directory. So I put it in my temp directory and I click save. It's now in my temp directory. And if I want to go back to the last place I was, I click there. So downloading means, um, take a document from uh, up in the cloud, up in the web somewhere, and bring it down onto my computer in its original form. Now, I'm going to show you a couple of other little features here. Uh, if you click on these two little hash marks, you can see some other um, websites that, you have made, that I have made bookmarks for. They're the ones that don't fit in my bookmarks bar. This guy here is called the bookmarks bar, and it's got all these different places that I can go that I frequently do go. But one of the most important things is the three dots up here next to my face. 
allow me to get to my settings. And every browser has settings. And notice what it did was it opened a brand new tab and I can now talk about how I autofill passwords and about privacy, clearing data, how it looks, what theme I want to use, the font size I want to use, the search engine I want to use, and what to do on startup and all this other stuff. But now I'm going to show you a couple of little tricks here. What if I wanted to go to TLC's website all the time? I can go up here to the little thing to the left of TLC, or there's a lock. I hold the left mouse button down and I drag it onto my desktop. And there it is. It's now an icon and it's Firefox because that's my default browser here. So if I now double click on this, I get TLC's website in Firefox. So there I've put that bookmark right there on my desktop for all to see. And um, I want to talk a little bit now about search engines. So I'm going to come here and I'm going to search for something and I'm going to say I'm going to click in mortgage finance rates um, and I'm and in here actually this is showing me news about mortgage finance rates that's really not what I want to do so I'm going to come up here and I'm just going to type google.com and I'm going to type it in the search in this bar here And now I'm seeing a bunch of websites about mortgage refinance and what to do here. What happened was it took the text that I was entering and sent it to the web server, to the search engine. The search engine looked in its huge databases and they are absolutely unbelievably big and applied a lot of long learned logic, machine learning, artificial intelligence to come up with the websites that not only will probably give me what I want, but will give them revenue because they're advertising these sites. Now, notice that I can come in here to the address bar and I can type in mortgage refinance rates and I get the same thing. In other words, you don't need to have a search page. You could anytime you have a window and I'm going to close this, I'm going to go to a new tab and I'm just going to type in, um, I'm going to type in, let's say, um, low cost airfare New, new York. Okay. What do I get? I get American Airlines, right? I get Priceline.com. I get a place called LowFares.com. I even get some actual prices. And that's all you really have to do to do searching. Um, and we're going to move on now to the next um, thing. But before we do, I want to show a few things about the Google, uh, about the Gmail page. First, I want to show you that as I move around, once again, I demonstrated this in the last talk the cursor changes you have to check the mouse cursor to see what's going on the hand means you may click here okay and so notice now I'm in the middle of this and it's got a text cursor meaning I've got text if I get down here I can click on that and it'll try to send mail I can do all kinds of things and I'm gonna click this back arrow once again notice it popped up and says back to inbox so I do this left arrow and now I've got my inbox again now notice over here I'm moving around, but when I get here, it changes to a different cursor and it lets me move this thing up and down. Once again, the model here, as I explained in the last talk, is you must be curious. You must explore. And the main tool to explore is just your mouse pointer. If I hover it over this, I get support. If I hover it over the gear, I get settings. If I hover it over the nine dots, I get Google Apps. And there's all kinds of other things that you can do. And, we'll, and you can go back to the other talk if that's not familiar to you. Okay, now we're going to talk about clouds. Everybody talks about clouds these days. What's a cloud? Well, no, not the kind in the sky. So what is it? A cloud is a particular kind of web server running on a remote computer somewhere in cyberspace that lets you store and retrieve files from its file system, from its hard drives. And you can move files from your personal computer up into the cloud. That's an upload. You can take files from up in the cloud and bring them to your computer. That's a download. But fundamentally, they are remote drives. They're just like a thumb drive. Think of it like a thumb drive in the sky. And um, 
Some clouds are free-ish. You get some space. Maybe you don't have all the features you'd like, but clouds are the best way to share documents for the team, for any team. And we here at TLC have a Google cloud called G Suite. And in that we have a drive that some of which there we have personal drives for each of us and we have a shared drive that we can all see, at least those of us who are members of the, the G Suite team. Now, sometimes clouds let you directly edit documents in a browser. Google Docs does this. However, most of the time, what happens is, and I use the analogy of a lending library here, and that is where you go to the lending library, you check out a book, you go home and you do what you needed to the book and you put it back. Except that this is like a user author, a personal authorship lending library. What you do with the cloud is you, somebody puts up there and says, I, I put the budget up in the cloud in the usual place. And so you go to the usual place, you download that budget, you make comments, you make changes, and you upload it back to the cloud. And then somebody else can go get it and download it and upload it. And of course, sometimes you have problems if somebody else downloads it and uploads a different version, but that's something you just have to deal with. That's why editing directly in a browser is nice. But we don't do that here at TLC, at least not yet. What we do is put things in the cloud, send somebody a piece of mail saying, oh, the new, the new uh, financial information is up there or the new viewership from YouTube information is up there. I send email to Pat and say my statistics are there, so go get them. And she knows where to look. I don't have to tell her anything else because she knows where my reports are going to go. What does the cloud look like? Well, it's back to my first part of this talk. There's files and folders everywhere. It is exactly the same logical process, logical metaphor that we had with hard drives, where you have folders which are named containers. Those named containers can contain folders and contain files. Files are just uh, named chunks of space with some kind of document type. It could be a, a whole movie and be four gigabytes long, or it could be a URL. It could be 40 characters long. It doesn't matter. A file is just a chunk of space, and it's up to the system to know where to put it. The system generally doesn't have a lot of idea about what's in it. That's up to you. But the way the clouds are organized is very much like exactly what you do with your own hard drive or your own thumb drives. Now, one thing clouds do that's a little different for most people, although Windows and Mac OS and others let you do this too, you generally don't see it because you don't work in a business environment. Clouds will let you collaborate and they will let you just view things or they'll let people just get a link to something. In other words, you can say, I wrote this document, but I want my team to be able to edit it or change it. Or you can say, I wrote this document and I want the people on my team just to be able to look at it. Or you can send a link to people and say, you can look at this, but you can't look at anything else in that folder. So um, most clouds let you determine what's called access control, meaning who gets to look at it, who gets to do what to it. One of the best features of clouds is that they most of the time, by default, keep older versions of files as automatic backup. In other words, it has happened to me several times with people I've worked with that they download a file, they make some changes to it, they upload it, and they realize, oh no, I deleted that whole section, or oh no, I put it in the wrong place. Well, you can just go back to the, to the cloud and ask it for an older version of the same file and see if that's what you want. The other thing that clouds do that is absolutely amazing is their job is to never lose a damn thing. They guarantee disaster recovery. So not only are you looking at someone else's remote drive and storing files in their remote drive, those files are also backed up and they're backed and the backups are backed up in such a way that you can request that they um, give you back data from long ago. And if something were to happen to that cloud or to your computer, you could do what's called disaster recovery. My son had a situation where he inadvertently deleted a bunch of important files from one of his Gmail clouds from Google Drive. He contacted their support and they went back to their backups and they got him those files back. And that is magic. And I love that. Well, what do you get in a cloud? Well, some of them are called, one of them is called Box and another is called Dropbox. Microsoft has a product called OneCloud. Google has Drive and Apple has iCloud. Most of them, when you sign up, give you some space for free, anything from five gigabytes to 100 gigabytes. If you want multiple users or more space, you usually have to have a paid subscription. Here's something a lot of people need to know, and a lot of them don't. Every Gmail account, you get a free drive. So your free Gmail account, 
has the additional uh, uh, perk of having a personal drive of up to five gigabytes of data. Five gigabytes is a lot for most people. Exactly how clouds work uh, is varies from place to place. I find them all to be more or less the same because it's all files and folders. But how you declare new users and how you limit access and how much backup you keep and all that, that's going to be up to you. And then I'm going to talk a little about a thing called synchronization. And they all support synchronization in one level or another, but uh, we'll talk about what that is in a minute. Now, once again, uploading is when you copy a file from your computer to the cloud. Downloading is just the opposite. You've seen downloading. I'm going to show you uploading. You can upload and download entire folders with some clouds. So you can actually take a whole folder with 150 files in it and put it up in a cloud somewhere, and good luck with that. I don't recommend that, but many of them allow you to do that. When you download entire folders, usually they come to you as a giant zip file. So that's something that is another talk for another day. So generally speaking, I don't recommend that you do more than copy one document at a time. And for most clouds, you just create files and folders and give them names just like you do on your own computer. It's no different at all. Some clouds, however, enforce a, 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 file st a folder structure where you put photos in one place and videos in another, and you put you know, contacts somewhere else and your schedule somewhere else. And Apple's iCloud is an example of this. Google does a little of it, so does Microsoft. I tend to ignore all that and do my own thing, as you can probably imagine. Now, synchronization for clouds means you have a place on your hard drive, your local machine, your, your solid state drive or hard drive, that's got some folders in it. And then you have a place in the cloud that's got the same folders and the same data. And what'll happen is, when you change your computer, it will automatically upload and keep the most current version on the cloud. If you're in a team, and somebody else changes one of those documents, the version you look at on your computer will automatically change. So this synchronization means keeping completely up to date. I don't do much of this, but a lot of people do. Microsoft in Windows 10 has a built-in synchronization facility for OneCloud in, built into Windows 10. It can be a little confusing, but it works really well, and it conceptually is no different. Instead of having your own main hard drive, you have a hard drive you can think of as OneCloud, and it has if your documents are in OneCloud, you can still edit them and work on them, but when you finish editing them, they will get copied up to OneCloud, and you'll always have a backup. And I'm not going to talk about synchronization anymore. Now I'm going to show you some demonstrations at this point of some of these things we're talking about, mostly having to do with showing you how Google Drive works. So I'm going to bring Chrome back up here, and I'm going to go to the nine dots and click on it. And one of them is this tricolored yellow, green, blue Drive lo logo. Now notice what it did is it opened a new tab that says My Drive Google Drive. And if you do this in your Gmail, you're going to have My Drive. Now, I don't have anything in this My Drive. I don't need it. However, a special thing we have for TLC is the very next thing. It's called Shared Drives. And I can click this magic little triangle to the left, and I can see that there's two major top-level folders, one called Google Forms and one called TLC Shared Files. Google Forms is where we maintain... Um, the uh, online forms for things like time reporting and registration for events. But the TLC shared files is where all the good stuff is. If I click on that, you can see, whoa, there's a lot of stuff. And notice the scroll bar just appeared. So I can click over here and drag this around. We have things like financial information, flyers, stuff for the board, the mailing lists, manuals that Bonnie and I have written. And I'll go into my technology folder. Now notice in my technology folder, I have more technology, I have more folders. I have one called backups. And these are backups of the website and, and other things that are very important to us. We have videos, uh, we have stuff, the specific backups for the website, and Zoom things, things about Zoom and how to use Zoom and all that. But again, take, take a close look at what's going on up here. TLC shared files, technology, Zoom. That means in the TLC shared files folder, which is the top level, there is a folder called technology. And in technology, there's a folder called Zoom. These are all names that I made up. And in there, there's some stuff. Now I'm gonna click on, I'm gonna right click on this Zoom video considerations, and I'm gonna find download, okay? Now it's coming up and asking me where to download it, and I'm gonna go ahead and save it there, okay? 
But now I'm going to come over here and I'm going to open my computer and I'm going to go to my temp folder and I'm going to get this document called using Zoom events and I'm going to upload it. Now I can right click in the white space over here and I can say upload files and I can go to that folder which is called temp. I can choose that file and I can click open and watch what happens. At the bottom of the screen you say it says one upload complete and there it is. So now I can click on it and it says it was uploaded at 1.43 p.m. by me. And if I click on it, double click on it, there it is. Boom. I've got a view of it. Now this is not a PDF view. This is merely Google's way of giving me a preview. But I can, I can look back at um, the things I'm looking at and I can see um, the uh, layout of the files and folders and I can actually make that bigger. Let's see, does it work? There it goes. So now I've made it bigger so I can see all the stuff in there. I can click in Zoom, close this window and down at the bottom of Chrome there's this little sub window, this, this skinny horizontal pane and if I right click, if I left click on this upper arrow it says um, show in folder, open, various other stuff. So I can also close that because it goes away when I, it, it shows up only when I download or upload. So um, I'm showing you the, the, the folder tree, but the thing I want you to notice is how comparable, I'm going to go over to my computer again and I'm going to go to my backup folder um, and I'm going to go, well, let's go to personal for a minute, okay? So notice I've got it uh, over here in my personal folder um, I've got documents and I've got, uh, here's one called Vacations and here's one called Costa Rica 2018. But it's the same idea as what you have here. Here I have, I have TLC Shared Files, Technology, Zoom. And take a look over here at the Windows Explorer window. It says Documents, Backup, Personal, Vacations, Costa Rica 2018. Now over here, it says TLC Shared Files, Technology, Zoom. It's the same idea. It's all files and all folders everywhere. Once again, after you watch this video, you should, you should go back through the video and practice doing what I'm doing using your own Gmail account or whatever cloud you happen to be using. Okay, we're into the last section of the document right now. Security. How do you be safe? Now, there's no practice here. There's no demonstrations. It's just going to be... Uh, secure information, information to make you a safer person out on the web. What is a virus? A computer virus is a program that tries to put itself on as many computers as possible with, with or without permission. And in other words, it replicates like viruses do. That's where the name came from. Most of them are bad actors. They try to maliciously steal your data, mess with your computers, lock, encrypt your data and lock it up. And modern systems are getting better and better at being resistant to viruses. Things are much, much better than they used to be. They're not perfect, but they're much, much better. An antivirus is a program that tries to block viruses. That's, ex that's exactly what you'd call an antivirus in today's medicine. Windows 10 comes with a built-in free antivirus called Windows Defender. And that's what I use. Now, there's other ones you can buy that have a little bit better rating, but they all cost money. And I have had problems with other ones. So... I don't want to go into the boring technical details that I've had with other antiviruses. I don't not recommend them, but I don't believe you need them. I think Windows Defender is perfectly fine. And if you're running a Windows machine and you're running McAfee or some Bitdefender or something like that, if you just go in and remove those programs, Windows Defender will take over. You will not be unprotected. You will have an automatically built-in free antivirus. You might have heard the term firewall. Well, the firewall is really an old term from, from railroad times when the uh, engineer sat behind a great big burner that was boiling water to make steam and, there was a, and he needed something to block the fire from coming through the wall. They were usually made of asbestos and that was a problem, but nonetheless, they saved lives. In a car, a firewall is the same thing. It, it, it's a big metal wall with anti-inflammatory properties that sits between you and your engine. A firewall in a computer sense is a program that tries to block suspicious or unintended connections either to your computer, which is the big problem, or from your computer. Now, generally, 
you've already got really good firewall protection from your home's router, whether you're cable or DSL or whatever. Um, if you're running on Verizon or some cellular service, they're going to prevent people from trying to connect to your phone directly. Um, and these firewalls generally are very smart. They don't need to be configured or changed. I fiddle with my home router's firewall because there's things I want to do like run a, run a website or other services, and I know how to do it. Uh, bottom line is don't do it. I'm trying to explain what a firewall is, not how to use it. So Windows 10, every Windows 10 system and others have built-in firewalls that most of the time operate without user configuration. The main message here is if you start seeing pop-ups from Windows Firewall, you probably have a program on your computer that's not a good actor. It's causing trouble, and you want to stop that trouble. And don't fiddle with the Windows Firewall configuration. Always let somebody who knows a lot do that because things can just break. Now, you can fix them. They're not broken forever. But you could, for example, cut off all connection to websites very easily. I mean, one bad keystroke and you see no websites anymore. So don't do that. Best practices. Now, the term best practices has come in the last 10 years to mean what it says. What are the things that you just kind of do without thinking that you really have to have a good reason not to do? Number one, never install anything you don't really need. And I, don't, I mean, don't let your brother-in-law tell you, oh, there's a great gambling website or somebody say, oh, there's a new social media site or whatever. Just if, you're, if they're websites, you can visit them and look at them if they want you to install programs. You just say no. You pull a Nancy Reagan on them. If you get pop-ups that, that you don't understand, never say yes. Either close the window or say no. And avoid suspicious websites. If you hear about a website that sounds interesting, but you're not sure that it might not be hinky, use an iPhone or an iPad or a tablet or an Android phone to visit it. If anything bad happens, it's very easy to reset your device. And most phones and tablets, it won't work anyway because they don't try to hack those. So you can then look at it and see if it's behaving correctly, if things are working right, and then you can try it on your computer. You need to use a lot of passwords. A good password manager will generate really hard to guess passwords for you. If you're not using a password manager, don't reuse your passwords. If somebody figures out how to hack your Gmail, I'm really hopeful that you've got a different password on your bank account, okay, and vice versa. Never give your data to anyone unless you're sure that person's from the company in question. When people call and say, I'm from Microsoft or I'm from Google, they're lying. Hello, nobody does that. The IRS doesn't do that. The Social Security Administration doesn't do that. Nobody calls you cold and says, you've got a problem with your computer. Those people are lying. 99.9999999% of the time, those people are thieves. I've had it happen to me but I know better. Now, if anybody ever asks you for your password, that's a red flag. They should know your password and they should verify who you are with other things like security questions or your birth date or the last purchase, like at Amazon, the last purchase you made, so $47.32 for chili sauce. They're going to want to know that. That's a much better thing than knowing your password because a lot of times when you're hacked, somebody else knows your password. If anybody ever asks you for your credentials, your password, your bank account number, that's a bad actor. Hang up on that person and report them to the police if you know who they are. I practice limiting my online shopping to a few very well-known websites. I use Amazon, I use B&H Photo Video, and a couple of others. And always pay with a credit card or PayPal. And I've got a document that describes this in more detail, which you can get from us. There's links in this, in this slide deck. And the reason you use a credit card is because under American law, you're limited to only $50 of personal charges for fraud. If somebody commits a bigger fraud than that, you don't pay another nickel. And I know because it's happened to me. We got our card cloned in Italy one time and they charged over $40,000 worth of crap until they were shut off and all that money didn't happen to me. Now, remember, everybody's trying to sell you something. There's almost no really free, open handed good actors on the web. Everybody wants either to sell you something or to get your data and to sell it to somebody else. So just be very, very wary. Final word in this, not the, quite the final word. Um, I, I was looking at the wrong slide. Use separate accounts for all users of your computer. Whenever possible, spouses should not share email accounts or Windows logins. Windows, as I said in the previous talk, is designed, and so is Mac OS and Linux if you use that, 
to have every individual person have a different view of that computer, different documents, folders, different desktops, different email accounts. And I really recommend that you don't do that. And if you've got a shared one now, one or the other of you can open a different account, start up a different account on the same machine and just migrate over to using that because it gets confusing. And what can happen is if one person goes to a bad website, you're hacked too. And as far as kids or other people, never loan your computer. Never let anyone else sit down at your computer and use it. There are ways that you can have a guest account on your computer and this is what we did with our grandkids. I set up a, you know, an account called Grandkids. And they could sit. And they, actually, we had two granddaughters, and they each had an account. But they are limited. They can't do everything. They can't download. They can't install. They can't remove programs. They can't delete files that, are, that they don't own. So there's a way that you can have what's called a guest account. And that keeps people from doing bad things. These days, it's not much of a problem. Everyone brings his own device. When they come, people come to stay, they typically have their own pads and their own phones. But if anybody wants to use your computer... You say, I'm sorry, we don't do that. Go away. Now, a lot of home routers have what's called a guest network. I use that. The difference is if you've got other computers on your network, as we do, if somebody goes onto your Wi-Fi from a phone or a tablet, that person can connect to your computer if you're not careful. For example, I can have my Android tablet and I can connect to your Windows public directory most of the time and look at your files in your public folder. I can't look at other files unless I happen to know your passwords, but I can poke around. What I do is I have a router that lets me set up a guest network. And when people are on my guest network, there's only one thing they can do, go to the internet. And I don't care what they do on the internet, not my problem. I do care if they use my system to do things to my computers. So you can check with your provider and see if there's a guest network. I think Xfinity supports a guest network. I don't know about uh, CenturyLink and others. If anything really confusing happens, find somebody you can ask. Don't freak out. Just don't do whatever people are wanting to you. Don't click yes. Don't give anybody your credit card information. Don't download and install anything. Don't freak out. Find someone to talk to. We're working on policies and procedures for people to call various people in the villages at the computer clubs and get some real help. Main answer is most of the time when somebody wants your information or wants to install something, they're bad. Don't do it. And finally, always do as many updates through your system as possible. They're very important and they can, when they find a serious problem, the sooner you get an update, the safer you'll be. I've read a document. It's this link here. Um, and if it's in blue, if you click on it in your PDF, you'll be able to read it. It has the inf all, a lot of the information in this section about security. And one of the ones it has is how to look at a URL and figure out whether it's valid or not. It's kind of hard to do. So the rule of thumb is when you get a pop-up or email message about problems with your account, don't click on any link in that pop-up or email or whatever it is or, or, or text message. Do not do that. You go, to a, you go to your browser, whether it's Safari on the iPad or whether it's Chrome on the, on the Windows or uh, Safari on Mac OS, and go to your website the way you always do. Go to your bank account the way you always do. Go to Amazon the way you always do. And look to see, because if you have a problem, it'll say so right there and it'll tell you what to do or whom to call. If you start clicking away at messages about problems with your account, you're going to have a problem. You can ask John Podesta about that because he had a real problem. And um, he was Hillary Clinton's campaign advisor. And he got an email about a problem with his Google account and clicked into a link. And the next thing you know, they had his, all his credentials for his email account. So just don't do it. Never, never, never click on anything in a pop-up or email message directly. Now, there are exceptions to this, as there always are in life. But the general rule is when somebody's valid, like I have a Schwab account, if Schwab sends me a message, they say, just log into your Schwab account. There's no URL in there. There's no clicky thing. It just says, log into your, your, your Schwab account. And up, up at the top of my page, it'll say, oh, your 1099s are ready for 2020 or whatever. And I'll click on that. But they won't ask me to click on a link in the, in the, in the message because they know that that's how most people get hacked. Okay, finally and foremost, backup, backup, backup. You must back up your work. You must back up your work. I will sit here and say it again all night long on a loop. If you don't copy your files to somewhere like a cloud or a thumb drive or some other portable hard drive or some other place on your hard drive, 
then there is no one to blame for failure but you. Clouds are far and away the best way to back up, primarily because they're cheap, they're easy, they're disaster-proof, they keep old versions, and they can't be stolen. And you can use thumb drives or external drives, but you should always check, go back and look at that thumb drive and external drive, leave it plugged in and click around and make sure you got everything you thought you got and make sure you can find it. So if your main drive burns out or somebody steals your computer, you actually have what you thought you had. And my final words to you today are investigate using a password manager. And again, you can find out all about password managers. There's a bunch of them. I've written two of them myself that my wife and I use. Okay, thank you very much for your attention. The final thing I want to say is one of my favorite quotes from Isaac Newton. Pointless quote number two. If I have seen further, it is by standing on the shoulders of giants. What he meant by that was none of us are in this alone. Everybody has a starting point. Everybody begins moving forward from that starting point and relies on the hard work, intelligence, diligence, and human considerations of those who have gone before. Thank you very much.